everyone. Good evening, Althea. Hello, everybody. All right. We are back. <laughs> Joseph. Oh, yes. Joseph. Hi, Can Ines. You get a chance? Hi. Yes. Uh, can you give me a call? Yes. Um. Tonight. Okay. With, with tonight this evening, or tomorrow night. You got it. You got it. I'll give you a Thank quick. You. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. Okay. Bye bye. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye. So welcome back to Through the Word, everyone. God bless you all. We are currently going through a three month study on the Eucharistic Lord. We are in the midst of a three-year revival. The, the bishops of the church uh, in, in America has us going through a three-year revival, uh, a, a Eucharistic revival. And so I said, you know what? Let's do three months, a deep dive into the various aspects, the different angles in which we can explore this central mystery of our faith. Um, the continuation of the incarnation, the body, blood, soul, and divinity under the sacramental veil, the, the sacrament of sacraments. The church also calls it the sacrament of love, the sacrament of the altar. We, of course, are speaking of the Holy Eucharist. And so that is what we are doing. And we have, uh, for the first several weeks of our study, we've looked at the beautiful and uh perplexing passage in the gospel of john chapter six uh the bread of life discourse and then uh last week we explored one of the gospels uh there the account of jesus multiplying the fish and the loaves and so much that we can really explore here. And, and we're going to continue in this as we are doing. Now, tonight's uh, study is the beginning of a, of a several part mini series, just like we did that sort of bread of life discourse that was four parts. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure how many parts this will be, but this is part one tonight for a mini series titled God is Enough. God is enough. And this is a great reminder for all of us who are just by virtue of the fact that we live in this world, perhaps are tempted to think and believe the contrary, that God is not enough, that I need this and this and this. And yes, I can also bring God into the mix and such and such. But what we're going to begin to explore this evening is really one of the beautiful truths that come out of our faith as Catholic Christians, which is that God is enough. In fact, God is all. He is everything. And even if we had nothing else in the world, but we had God, we would have more than those who have everything in the world, but do not have God, right? So, so I want you to think about that as we move forward. And, and we're going to see how that frame of reference really can begin to shape and inform so much of our lives as followers of Jesus Christ. So Again, the title is God is Enough, and this evening is part one. As we always do, we begin in a word of prayer. And so I invite you to pray with me in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And so, Lord, we ask, we beg, we plead with you, O God, that you would bless our time together we ask, O oh Lord, in thanksgiving that you have brought us here. We ask that you would open 
the eyes of our heart to discern the word that you want us to hear and see this evening. Open the scriptures to us, O Holy Spirit, since you are the author. You, O divine paraclete, counsel us, be with us, enlighten our minds and our hearts, open wide our souls, that we may be nourished through your word. And as we continue this series, Lord, as we continue this study of your Eucharistic presence, we ask that you would increase within each and every one of us a desire to run to the holy table. Help us to nurture the proper disposition we need to receive as frequently as we do the Holy Eucharist, to receive you, Lord, the bread of life, so that we may in turn receive this, the graces we need for our salvation and all those intentions we bring to you. We pray to our Blessed Mother asking for an intercession, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Queen of Martyrs, pray for us. Our Lady, Seat of Wisdom, pray for us. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Terror of demons. Pray for us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, let me see here. So yes, God is enough. Now, what we've been doing is we've sojourned into the catechism of the Catholic Church, which is what we're going to do again tonight. We'll look at a few sections there and then pivot moving into the Holy Scriptures. The purpose of the Catechism, right? One of the reasons why we are beginning every study with the Catechism is because it, it communicates to us the mind and the heart of the Church on the particular matter that we're studying, which is the Holy Eucharist. And so here we turn to section 1356 through 1358 of the Catechism, as we now consider the Eucharist in a new light. 1356 reads as follows. If from the beginning Christians have celebrated the Eucharist and in a form whose substance has not changed despite the great diversity of times and liturgies, it is because we know ourselves to be bound by the command the Lord gave on the eve of his passion, that is Holy Thursday, do this in remembrance of me. And so what 1356 is uh, sharing with us, what it's communicating to us, is that all of us are bound by this holy command given by Christ himself and Holy Scripture and the tradition of the church to come to the altar, to come to the table, and to do so as an act of remembrance. And that word Greek, the Greek word for remembrance there or remembering is actually quite potent. There, there is a lot that is meant theologically. And I'm not going to bog you down with the great uh, details there. But the main element that I want us to get from 1356 is that Christ beckons us to the holy sacrifice of the Mass. He calls us to the Eucharist. And that the substance of the Eucharist, the celebration uh, in which the Eucharist is celebrated, the divine liturgies, the Mass, if we look at the 2,000 years of the history of the Church, there are different liturgical expressions. And nevertheless, the substance is the same. The substance remains the same. And we have many different liturgies today. The one holy Catholic and apostolic church, those churches who are in union with the Bishop of Rome, the See of Peter, 
um, there are more than just a Latin rite of the church. For many Catholics, this is like new information, right? <laughs> when we think of the Catholic church, many of the times we just think of Roman Catholicism. We think of just the Latin church, right? And, and, and the liturgy that is a Latin liturgy. Um, <clears throat> but that's actually not the full church. Uh, there are 23 other rites, liturgical rites, and other churches that are in union with the Bishop of Rome. Um, one of my favorite saints, for instance, is Saint Charbel of Lebanon. And he belonged to the Maronite Church. And the Maronite Church is one of the many different liturgical rites that is in union with the Bishop of Rome. Uh, and it's a different liturgy. And yet, if you were to attend uh, the divine liturgy of the Maronite order, you would be able um, to note the movement, right? Then there's a liturgy of the word, there's a liturgy of the sacrament, and, and the movements are similar, even though it may be uh, in a different language or the way things are done or as differently, certain pious practices and devotions are expressed differently, and yet the substance remains the same. So that's one of the things that's being shared here. Now, before we move into 1357, let me just highlight this element, right? Do this in remembrance of me. One of the continual commands of our Lord given in all of Scripture, and we see this especially in the Old Testament, is remembering God remembering his commandments, remembering his ordinances. And for those of you who've been with me for some time, you've probably heard me quote this old rabbinic saying, which is really wise. I'm going to say it right now, which is this, to forget the Lord is to sin. To forget the Lord is to sin. Now, now what does that mean? That doesn't mean that if I'm not currently cognizant of, of, of God, then I'm somehow sinning. That's not what's being said there. Rather, what's being articulated in that beautiful proverbial saying is this, that when we are forgetting God, that is to say, when we're living in such a way that is not conscientious of our Lord, right? We're, we're living in such a way where we forget that we are under the Lordship of Christ. Then we are <laughs> really open to sin, right? We're going to most likely fall into something that's not so good for us. And so when you see here Christ saying, do this in remembrance of me, in one sense, this is a command that echoes all the way through all of scripture, going all the way back to the beginning. But of course, given that it's in the New Testament and given the solemnity and the great mystery and power of this Eucharist, it's taken up into something infinitely more resplendent. So we'll think about that phrase, do this in remembrance of me in the coming weeks. But let's push on here to 1357 of the Catechism. It goes on to say, we carry out this command of the Lord by celebrating the memorial of his sacrifice. And so doing, we offer to the Father what he has himself given us the gifts of his creation, bread and wine, which by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the words of Christ have become the body and blood of Christ. Christ is thus really and mysteriously made present. So one of the things that I really want all of us to take note here in 1357 is the Eucharist, excuse me, the Trinitarian formula in, in that particular sentence that is underscored here, where it says, in so doing, we offer to the Father, and so forth, right? Notice God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit beautifully operative in this giving of this sacrament of sacraments to us, the church. And Christ thus is really and mysteriously made present. We must therefore, 1358 goes on to say, we must therefore consider the Eucharist as, and there are three bullets here, bullet number one, 
thanksgiving and praise to the Father. Bullet two, the sacrificial memorial of Christ and his body. And bullet three, the presence of Christ by the power of his word and of his spirit. Mm. I, I just, it's just really amazing here. And there's much to meditate on. But friends, here's what I want us to consider. Isn't it wonderful that God would make present his very holy son, our Lord and Savior, in the sacrament of the altar, right? Here we are historically removed from the event of Golgotha, of the tomb and of the resurrection, removed historically and yet brought into contact with what took place 2,000 years ago, not because the Mass is a time machine, but rather through the power of the Holy Spirit, Christ is brought to us in the here and now, the Holy Eucharist. Bread comes down for us, bread from heaven. How is it possible that Christ's once and for all sacrifice that took place 2,000 years ago and all the events surrounding this mystery, how is it possible that that could somehow touch upon my very life in your life in 2023? This is a mystery beyond conception, without a doubt, and yet we know the church teaches and the theologians will articulate that this is only possible precisely because God is at the center God is the author of the impossible. He is able to do what only he can do. And by virtue of the fact that God is God, God is eternal. Now, one of the reasons why we pray in the uh, when we meditate in, uh, upon the mysteries, let's say like in, in the recitation of the Holy Rosary, we are meditating on the life of Christ and our Blessed Mother, and particularly the life of Christ, What's happening there is a recognition, a recognizing, that's what the word recognition is, to, to think the thought again, recognize the mystery that is eternal because Christ is not only fully human, but fully God. Now, perhaps I've lost some of us in my in my. <laughs> jumbling speech here as we're thinking theologically, but the key thing that I want us to get for us tonight is this, that God is not time bound. Neither is he limited in any way. He desires to give us his kingdom, to give us his very self in the Holy Eucharist. And so God is showing us here, there is a, there is a, 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 a pedagogical approach, a teaching, a teaching methodology that is being unfolded in the perpetual offering of the Holy Eucharist. That God says, no, I see you and I am here to provide for you a covering for your sins, clothing for your spiritual back sustenance for your spiritual stomach, all that you need so that you can enter into glory. And so the question is not whether or not God is providing, but whether or not we are receptive to what God has for each and every one of us, which is why St. Paul says, look, we don't walk by a lot by, by sight, but rather by faith. And it's the, the logic of faith that is able to ascertain these things. Now, what we're going to look at this evening is a passage that we will be in for the next couple of weeks, beginning here in the book of Exodus, one of the most spectacular pieces of literature and scriptures. Uh, the book of Exodus is an amazing story. It's the second book in the Bible. Right? You have Genesis and Exodus. And here in chapter 15 is, is, is quite stunning. And you'll see why we're, we're here in, in just a moment. But let me give you some background. For those of us who may have not 
read Exodus or you've never seen that classical movie of Moses, right? Let my people go, right? It's the story of Moses and the people of Israel that were enslaved in bondage for over 400 years in Egypt. Moses himself, his story is quite fascinating. Uh, and he's called by God to go back and to deliver the people uh, into freedom from captivity. He's got to contend with Pharaoh and the false gods against the true and living God and all of this amazing, beautiful, spectacular, explosive narrative unfolding. And so here in Exodus 15, right, uh, what has happened already? The plagues have happened. The great disputation between Moses and Pharaoh, God and the false gods of Egypt occurred. The people of Israel are de delivered. They pass through the Red Sea. The army of Pharaohs, the, the armies of Pharaoh are wiped out, and the people of Israel are on the other side of the Red Sea, and they are free. And God is now leading them through the wilderness, through the desert, towards Mount Sinai, right? So they could enter into that covenantal relationship between Yahweh and the people, his people. Okay, so, so that's the context. And Exodus 15 is the beginning in this chapter. At the beginning of this chapter, which is what we're not beginning with, is the song of Moses and 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 this jubilation of of God's victory and and all of that there but we're going to begin here at Exodus 22 because here we begin to see something quite shocking and <laughs> quite shocking in fact if we've been reading through Exodus it, it may not be actually that shocking because we already see signs of this earlier on in the story what am I referring to here? The people of Israel complaining before God, <laughs> grumbling, doubting, uh, allowing fear and anxiety to take hold of them, right? Uh, right. When they get to the Red Sea and their backs are pressed against the proverbial wall of the water of the Red Sea, right? They're, they're led to the Red Sea and they turn around and they see pharaoh's armies descending upon them right they start to bug out they turn to moses why did god lead us here did he lead us here just so we can die were there not enough graves in egypt for us right they, they have the audacity to complain despite the fact they saw one miracle after another despite the fact that they saw the splendor and the glory of god for, for, for days and days already before this, right? One supernatural sign after another, this new situation, they're complaining, oh my gosh, Moses, we're dead. We're dead, bro. You brought us out here. God brought us out here. Why? I don't see a solution. And then Moses says, chill out, <laughs> right? right? And the sea is split. And so again, the sea splits, right? Where there is no way, God makes a way. Why? How? Because God is God. God can flex like that. That's what God does, right? So he makes a way and they rejoice. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. Our Lord is powerful. He's all splendor, right? And then look what happens. Now here we are in verse 22. Okay, that's the context. Then Moses led Israel from the Red Sea and they went out into the desert. <laughs> Uh, into the desert of Shur. For three days, they walked in the desert without finding water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink the water there because it was bitter. That is why it was named Mara, right? Which in Hebrew is bitter or bitterness. Now let's stop there for a second. Now, for those of you who are zooming in, you can see that I've uh, uh, emboldened the word three days. Yeah, that's tough. Um, it, walking in the desert one day without water, I, I, I don't know if I would survive. Three days is a long time without water in the desert. So here, this is a real challenge that the people are facing, okay? 
these are uh, extreme circumstances. This is not, you know, I, you know, I'm I'm walking without water in the middle of you know crossing Queens Boulevard, you know, before I have a drink of water. Right? This is this is the desert, right? This is this is serious, okay? And so look what happens here, right? Uh, they get to a body of water and it's not drinkable. They could not drink the water because the water is bitter. We don't know what that really means, right? Uh, it's salt water, is it, right? I'm, it's bitter, okay? So it seems, right? You can't drink it. And so verse 24, look at verse 24 now. So the people grumbled against Moses. Think of grumbling. If you ever want a great image of grumbling, um, think about hopping on the A train during rush hour when it's like a hot summer day. <laughs> People are not necessarily uh, uh, singing uh, hymns and, and, and a kind of breaking out into a, a, a Disney opera like, yay, right? People are grumbling. Don't touch me. Oh, my gosh. Everyone's breath is on top of me. People are smelling. It's hot. It's humid. Why is this? air condition not on, right? That's the feel, right? And so they're grumbling, okay? Um, and, and that's a word, by the way, that is going to be an operative word throughout uh, uh, the book of Exodus and the book of Numbers and the book of Deuteronomy, okay? So the books of Moses there. It, it's a recurring theme among the people. So the people grumbled against Moses saying, what are we to drink. Now let's 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 put a hard pause there. What's the significance of this, right? Well, let's look at it from the natural, which is very easy for us to do <laughs> because we tend to think naturally and rarely do we think supernaturally, which is in fact what St. Paul says we ought to do because we have been given the mind of Christ. So there are two ways of thinking. But let's approach this from the natural perspective. Naturally speaking, we can understand these guys. We were like, yeah, yeah. I mean, three days in the desert, no water. Dude, what are we doing here? Right? We're, we're, we're thirsty. We're going to die if we don't drink water soon. This is really tough. And to make matters worse, as it were, to put salt in the wound, as the old saying goes, they get to a body of water. They're probably saying to themselves, ah, thank you, God. We're going to finally drink. And what, up? what happens? It's not drinkable. So they're grumbling. They're upset. This is really annoying. This is scary. Or all of the feelings are bubbling up, right? And so they begin to leak. They begin to leak. You see a car that's leaking some fluid, you know, it's not healthy. The car, there's something wrong with the car. The same here, right? People, when people are grumbling, it's an expression of what's happening inside their heart. It's a sign that something is not right. Now, naturally, we would say, yeah, it makes sense that they're grumbling. But from the place of supernatural revelation and faith, it really doesn't make sense that they're grumbling. Why is that? Why is that? They just saw and witnessed and walked through the splitting of the Red Sea. And if the, as if that weren't enough, there was a pillar of fire leading them at night and a pillar of cloud leading them during the day. And if that weren't enough, they saw all the miracles that took place in Egypt, God showcasing his outstretched hand and his strong arm, as the Hebrew says, to deliver the people from slavery and captivity to Egypt. What am I saying here? They are direct witnesses of one miracle after another. I mean, the greatest miracles revealed, period, period, in this period of time. Okay? And so here is why the grumbling doesn't make any sense. They know <laughs> they've been in difficult times before and they have seen God provide. They have seen God make a way. They are direct inheritors of a testimony that no one else can speak of. Okay? 
They know the capability of God. They know the heart of God. They have heard his word through his spokesman, Moses, and through Aaron, right? They, I mean, they just have seen so many things. Why then are they grumbling? Do they not know they can turn to God in faith? See? So it's like, and I've used this analogy before with you guys, I think, before, but let me use it again. You know, it's like if you knew um, I had a lot of money in the bank, let's say I was just a millionaire, right? And I, I was going to Our Lady Queen of Martyrs, and you guys knew. It's like, oh, yeah, Joe's a celebrity, or, you know, maybe, you know, he's got money, but, but here he is. And then, and then you were puzzled. Because after mass, let's say, uh, we would strike up conversations. This would happen, let's say, more often than not. And one of the things you kept hearing me uh, uh, say uh, or express is a kind of grumbling. And I'm grumbling about my finances. I'm saying, oh, my gosh, can you believe they, they ra they're raising the Metro card? And, and, oh, my gosh, Trader Joe's. They opened up a Trader Joe's here, but the prices are, are ridiculous. I don't know if I can afford this. And. Oh, why, why are things so expensive? And you're going to look at me like, who? wait a minute, what? Because <laughs> you know that Joe has money. Let's say, let's say, again, hypothetically, Joe is a millionaire. You're going to say to yourself, why is this guy grumbling about money? He's got money. And so you would be correct in that thinking, right? In so far as you recognize a disconnect, you're recognizing a disconnect between what I'm saying and my expression and what I actually have access to. The same with this. Friends, the same with what we're seeing here. Three days in the desert with no water, that's tough. But why? Why are they grumbling? Because they're allowing their circumstances to dictate their response. Let me say that again. They're allowing their circumstances to dictate and to set the terms of their response. So anybody kind of looking into the story right now without considering all the supernatural wonders that have occurred, we all will be like, oh yeah, no, I, I get it. I get it. It's tough. I, I would be grumbling too. But through the eyes of faith, through the eyes of the supernatural revelation that has already been unfolding one after another, it doesn't make sense why they're grumbling. And clearly what's happening here is a test. This is a test, right? God wants to see what is really in their hearts. Now, that's, of course, a theological figure of speech, not as if God needs to do a test in order to see us, since God is omniscient, he knows all things. And so really the test is for us to reveal to us what's in our hearts. So when I'm grumbling, ah, I see what's really in my heart. Not faith, but doubt. Not faith and joy in the spirit, but a temptation towards despondency, fear, anxiety, complaining. Not counting my blessings and not recognizing the blesser behind the blessings and going to him, but rather focusing on my limits. Do you remember the passage we looked at last week? Remember when Jesus was multiplying the fish and the loaves and he says to the apostles, you give them something to eat. And they said, we need like 200 days worth of wages in order to pay these guys. I mean, in order to get the food that we would need. Right. And Jesus says, tell me what you have. So what was the, the key teaching point last week? Don't focus on what you don't have. Focus on what you do have and bring that to faith in Jesus and he will multiply it, right? But we fall into the place of grumbling and even perhaps in a more extreme way, despondency and straight rebellion and complaint against God when we're focused on what we don't have. And when that happens, our limits become our God rather than the abundant God we actually have recourse to. St. Paul, I'm going to keep saying this over and over again in the series. St. Paul says it beautifully. We walk by faith and not 
by sight. We walk by faith and not by sight. And the people here, by virtue of the fact that they're grumbling, is a clear indication that they're actually walking by sight and not by faith. And guess what this also indicates? How quick they are to forget. How quick they are to forget. Remember what we just read in the catechism. It's a call to remember, to remember. And I said that the ancient Hebrew, right, the, 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 the Jewish proverb, as it were, right, rabbis will say this, is that when we forget, we're going to fall into sin. To forget is to sin. And this is what's happening. Just a couple of days ago, they just saw the, the greatest miracle they've ever seen. And it's just, right, the, the, their present need crowds out their vision. They immediately forgot what God did and who God is, and they're focused on their limits. Oh, my gosh. How is this going? Oh, what's going on? And so that's why we are here in verse 24. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, what are we to drink? Amazing. Amazing. Just sit with that, friends. Sit with that. Right? What are we to drink? Hmm. Verse 25. And Moses cried out to the Lord. And the Lord showed him a log. <laughs> In many, most translations, it, it reads log. But the Hebrew word is tree. Mm. Now, you may be asking yourself, well, why, why is it then translated log? Well, well the, the next line tells you something. And when he, Moses, cast it into the waters, they were sweetened. So sometimes translators will say, okay, well, Mo did Moses take a tree and threw it into the water? So it's like maybe, maybe the word tree here in Hebrew can signify a smaller part of the tree, like a log. That's handed, right? That's 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 uh, portable. Maybe Moses with some people, and they picked it and threw it in. We don't know, but it's important to keep the Hebrew in mind. And here's why: the early fathers of the church, the fathers and the doctors of the church. By the way, all in lineage with the holy apostles. They read, and you guys know this already. If you've been with me for some time, they read the Old Testament, through the lens of Jesus Christ. They read the scriptures through the lens of Jesus Christ, recognizing that Christ is the key that unlocks the totality of the Hebrew Bible, of the Hebrew scriptures. It is only through the lens of Jesus and through his cross can we make sense of the deeper meaning of the Old Testament scriptures. And so when the fathers of the church would read this, they say, oh, this is good. They would say, this is one of those types, prophetic illusions, right? This is a figure, a shadow, or all of these words they'll use. This is a shadow of what is to come, the substance that is to come. This is but an intimation of. And so they read this in verse 25, and they say, look at this. God, the Lord, shows Moses a tree. And through the use of the tree, the bitter waters become sweet. Is this not the proclamation of the gospel? Which tree am I referring to here? Of course, the tree that our Lord and Savior Jesus died on, the old rugged cross. And so this is a prophetic illusion of how Christ's sacrificial offering to the eternal father in the unity of the spirit takes the bitterness of our sin, the bitterness of the waters that we are unable to drink or even swim in and transmutes it by virtue of his holy cross, right? By virtue of his cross so that the waters become sweet and we are able to drink salvation. This is how the church reads the scriptures, friends. 
Now, if you read this without the New Testament and you read it throughout without the lens of Christ, this is going to be a weird passage. It's like, okay, Moses sees a log. The Lord shows him a log. He throws a log into the water. The water becomes sweet. Okay, weird, weird. <laughs> but hey, God, God did it. But if you read it through what Christ actually did, it unveils everything. This is why, by the way, St. Paul will say, well, let me not, let me just, I was going to offer some other quotes, but we'll table that because we'll see all of that unfold. So, so this is amazing. Okay. And, and so again, verse 25, let me just read that one more time and we'll, we'll push forward. And Moses cried out to the Lord. The Lord answered him. Excuse me. The Lord showed him a log again, the Hebrew word tree. And when he cast it into the waters, they were sweetened. There the Lord made for them a statute and an ordinance. Look at this. And there he tested them. Ah, you see? It's a test. It's a test. Verse 26, saying, here's what God is saying. If you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord, your God, and do what is right in his eyes and pay attention to his commands and keep all his statutes. Then I will not bring on you any of the diseases I inflicted on the Egyptians. What is God referring to here? The plagues. The plagues that unfolded there. And look at this. One of the rare times in which God names himself. And God gives himself a title in the Old Testament. Here it is. For I am the Lord who heals you. Amazing. Amazing. Okay. So he gives them a statue. He says, look, I'm testing. Right. I'm, I'm right. I want you to take notice what's coming out of your own heart. Notice the grumbling here. Okay. And if you want to move past that, children of Israel, right? People of Israel. If you want to move past that, what you need to do is to listen carefully to the voice of the Lord and to do what is right, not in your eyes, in the eyes of the Lord, and to pay attention to his commands and, and, his, and, and, and his precepts and his statutes. Okay? Then you're going to walk in health and healing. And so what's interesting here is that when God says, for I am the Lord who heals you, Clearly, this is all connected to the whole situation that just took place. When he cast the log, that is the tree, into the waters, Moses, they were sweetened. Okay. So let's stop here before we read the last verse this evening, verse 27. What are the spiritual principles here? Like there's, there's a number of them. One of them that clearly echoes what we explored last week which is God is enough. God provides. The Lord provides. Dear friends, we could say that every day, multiple times a day, as a very good spiritual practice to guard us from grumbling and complaining and protecting us from allowing us to fall into anxiety and fear. Because when anxiety and fear take over, as I've said just several minutes ago, the circumstances that we are in will dictate the manner of our response. Okay? God says, listen to me. Pay attention to me. Follow my statutes. Keep my commandments, right? right? In other words, put me first in all things. That's what God is saying here. If you put me first in all things, you won't fall into the grumbling and to the complaining that you tend to do. Right? Listen carefully. Be present. Be attentive to the voice of God. Be present to God as he is present to me. Ah, oh, but Joe, how do I do this? How do I do this? I, I find it very difficult. I'm happy you asked. 
I'm happy you asked. Here's how you do it. Are we disciplined in our prayer life? Are we disciplined in our devotional life? Are we living a sacramental life? All of these questions are important because answering in the affirmative, saying yes to those questions, is the path on which we're able to do this. Because if I'm not disciplined in my prayer life, if I'm not picking up the scriptures to read, if I'm not preparing for the holy sacrifice of the mass, if I just go through the motions, if I go to a confession, ah, once in a while, I'm not even, my conscience is not even in tune with whether or not I'm in mortal sin. If I'm not picking up the holy rosary, whatever devotions that we have, if I'm not doing whatever these things that I'm doing in a disciplined fashion, how am I attentively listening to the voice of the Lord? How? How am I carefully listening to the voice of the Lord God? Right? How could I be doing what is right in his eyes if all I take in is the, the ways of the world? So when then negative things happen, it's going to be so easy for me to be co-opted by the logic of this fallen world and this fallen age. It's so easy, right? But when we listen carefully to the Lord, when we're pushing in in our devotional life, praying, attending the holy sacrifice of the mass, right, doing these things, guess all what we are experiencing? The healing of the Lord. For I am the Lord who heals you. Notice how God healed the waters, turning them from bitterness where they were not able to drink to sweet waters. Good to their tongue, delicious to their tongue, good to their bellies, nourishing their bodies, experiencing the refreshment that only comes through what? The tree. Through the cross, the holy cross, which redeems the world. This is the takeaway, friends. And notice how all of it comes from who? From God. The same God that is here is the same God that meets us every time we are in the divine liturgy. Every time at the altar, the hand of our Lord, the presence of our Lord, the very countenance of our Lord, the very heartbeat of Christ, our Lord, is offered to us. But I can take the bread from heaven without the proper disposition. I can come to the altar without bringing and connecting my struggles with the salvific work of Christ. And so, but when we, when we are pressing in in preparation, we come with open hearts and with open hands, we are receiving the greatest blessing that we can receive, dear friends. There's much to think about here. There's, there's so much to think about. Now, let's look at verse 27 as the final verse. Now, for those of you who are not zooming in, I emboldened the first word in verse 27. Then, then, then they came to Elim, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, and they camped there by the waters. Oh, my. Isn't that such a beautiful ending? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I mean, just hearing that and reading that, it just it looks so delicious. Because again, if you're in the desert, 12 springs of waters and 70 palm trees, let's go. It's a party. This is amazing, right? This is a great gift from our Lord. And so 
the ending is better than the beginning. But it's a test. You see, God, God wants the best for us. He wants the best. And the only way we can get to a place to receive the best from Christ, that is to receive Jesus himself. The only way we can get there is by cleaning out our hearts. Okay? You know, we speak of spring cleaning, right? We speak, we speak of dusting and mopping and vacuuming and swifting and swiffers and sweeping and all the right. And, and it's the same with our hearts, friends. Okay. We need our hearts cleansed. We need the proper. How do I do this? Where are my devotions? Am I taking time throughout the day to spend with the Lord? Okay. The, the enemy of your soul, the devil and the demons, they want you to be so busy every day. They want you to be so distracted. They want you to be so preoccupied with the television. Leave the TV on. Go on social media. Just spend hours there drooling over your phone. Oh, yeah. God knows you're having a difficult time. You need a little ease. Right? right? Just, just, and then next thing you know, you turn around, and you're like, where did the day go? I didn't even pray an hour, Father. I didn't even have an opportunity to spend 15 minutes in meditation before the Lord. What, what? Now, we go through days. Every day, we make sure to eat, brush our teeth. We, we have our meals. But then we want to know why we're not hearing the Lord. Why are we not experiencing the consolations in the spirit? Why does the mass seem so dead to me? I get nothing out of the mass. <laughs> I mean, if I'm not preparing, if I'm not spending time with God, again, look at the scripture. Look at the scripture here. Verse 26, if you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes and pay attention to his command and keep all this, then I will not, then I will br not bring on you any of the diseases. But we experience the sicknesses and the diseases of this age because we're not connected. We're not connecting with the Lord intentionally, and that requires discipline. It requires carving out that time, friends. So the 12 springs of water, the 70 palm trees, is the end. The end is better than the beginning. And amazing abundance provided. And by the way, dear friends, there's a lot to be read into that. 12 springs of water. How many tribes are in Israel? 12. A spring of water for every tribe. Look at that. God doesn't give you uh, leftovers. He's not giving you a little something. He's going he's gonna to make sure you are seated. Look at it. 70 palm trees. My goodness, 70 palm trees. Okay? There's, there's a significance there. So, friends, as we come to the end and as we open up for a large group process, here is, here is something I want us to think about. Okay? How is God challenging you through this scripture to challenge okay how is he doing it how is the what is the holy spirit bringing to your attention here hmm something to think about quick reminder i said it in the email uh today uh no class next week i have to cancel class unfortunately we'll be back the following week okay so no class next week the 13th Let's close out with a word of prayer, and then we'll bring us back together for a large group processing. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Oh, Heavenly Father, we are amazed by your word this evening. How you remind us of the importance of keeping you first in everything in our lives. When we fail 
to do that, Lord, how easy it is for us to fall into complaint and to engage in grumbling. It's very easy for us, Lord, to be co-opted by what is before our natural vision. But we ask, Lord Jesus, for the grace of faith, the supernatural virtue of faith. We need faith, Lord, so that our eyes may be kept on you and not the limiting circumstances that we find ourselves in, not the challenging circumstances that we find ourselves in. We should be able, Lord, to acknowledge the difficulties and bring those difficulties to you rather than allowing the difficulties to cause us to complain and grumble against you, Lord. This is the test, and this is the challenge we face. And so we ask, O oh Lord, grant us the grace to grow in this area. It is in your name we pray. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Let me stop the recording here.